Section 24 of Heart, A Schoolboy's Journal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Lewis, Houston, Texas. Heart, A Schoolboy's Journal by Edmondo Diamichis. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Chapter July. The last page from my mother. Saturday, first. So the year has come to an end, Enrico, and it is well that you should be left on the last day with the image of the sublime child who gave his life for his friend. You are now about to part from your teachers and companions, and I must impart to you some sad news. The separation will not last three months, but forever. Your father, for reasons connected with his profession, is obliged to leave Turin, and we are all to go with him. We shall go next autumn. You will have to enter a new school. You are sorry for this, are you not? For I am sure that you love your old school, or twice a day, for the space of four years. You have felt the pleasure of working, or for so long a time. You have seen, at stated hours, the same boys, the same teachers, the same parents, and your own father or mother awaiting you with a smile. Your old school, where your mind first unclosed, where you have found so many kind companions, where every word that you have heard has had your good for its object, and where you have not suffered a single trial which has not been useful to you. Then bear this affection with you, and bid the boys a hearty farewell. Some of them will undergo misfortunes. They will soon lose their fathers and mothers. Others will die young. Others, perhaps, will nobly shed their blood in battle. Many will become brave and honest workmen, the fathers of good and industrious workmen, like themselves. And who knows whether they may not also be among them one who will render great services to his country and make his name glorious. Then part from them with affection. Leave a portion of your soul here, in this great family into which you entered as a baby, and from which you emerge a young lad, and which your father and mother loved so dearly, because you were so much beloved by it. School is a mother, my Enrico. It took you from my arms when you could hardly speak, and now it returns you to me strong, good, studious, Blessings on it, and may you never forget it more, my son. Oh, it is impossible that you should forget it. You will become a man. You will make the tour of the world. You will see immense cities and wonderful monuments, and you will remember many among them. But that modest white edifice with those closed shutters and that little garden where the first flower of your intelligence budded, you will remember until the last day of your life as I shall remember the house in which I heard your voice for the first time. Your Mother The Examinations Tuesday, 4th Here are the examinations at last. Nothing is to be heard in the streets in the vicinity of the school from boys, fathers, mothers, and even tutors. Examinations, points, themes, averages, dismissals, promotions, all utter the same words. Yesterday morning there was composition. This morning there is arithmetic. It was touching to see all the parents as they took their sons to school, giving them their last advice in the street. And many mothers went with their sons to their seats to see whether the inkstand was filled and to try their pens. And they still continued to hover round the entrance and to say, Courage! Attention! I entreat you. Our assistant master was Karate, the one with the black beard, who mimics the voice of a lion and never punishes anyone. There were boys who were white with fear. When the teacher broke the seal of the letter from the town hall and drew out the problem, not a breath was audible. He read it loudly, staring now at one, now at another, with terrible eyes. But we knew that had he been able to announce the answer also, so that we might all get promoted, he would have been delighted. 
After an hour of work, many began to grow weary, for the problem was difficult. One cried. Carassi dealt himself blows on the head. And many of them are not to blame, poor boys, for not knowing, for they have not had much time to study and have been neglected by their parents. Stadi remained motionless for more than an hour with his eyes on the problem and his fist on his temples, and then he finished the whole thing in five minutes. The master made his round among the benches, saying, Be calm, be calm, I advise you to be calm. And when he saw that anyone was discouraged, he opened his mouth as though about to devour him like a lion, in order to make him laugh and inspire him with courage. Toward eleven o'clock, peeping down through the blinds, I saw many parents pacing the street in their impatience. There was Prokofsky's father in his blue blouse, who had deserted his shop with his face still quite black. There was Crossy's mother, the vegetable vendor, and Nali's mother, dressed in black, who could not stand still. A little before midday, my father arrived and raised his eyes to my window. My dear father, at noon we had all finished, and it was a sight at the close of school. Everyone ran to meet the boys, to ask questions, to turn over the leaves of the copy books, to compare them with the work of their comrades. How many sums? What is the total? And subtraction? And the answer? And the marking off of decimals? All the masters were running about, summoned in a hundred directions. My father took from my hand the rough copy, looked at it, and said, Very well indeed. Beside us was the blacksmith, Prokasi, who was also inspecting his son's work, but rather uneasily and not comprehending it. He turned to my father. Will you do me the favor to tell me the total? My father read the number. The other gazed and reckoned. Brave little one, he exclaimed, in perfect content. And my father and he looked at each other for a moment with a kindly smile, like two friends. My father offered his hand, and the other shook it, and they parted, saying, Until the oral examination, until the oral examination. After walking a few paces, we heard a falsetto voice, which made us turn our heads. It was the blacksmith singing. The Last Examination, Friday, 7th. This morning we had our oral examinations. At eight o'clock we were all in the schoolroom, and at a quarter past they began to call us, four at a time, into the big hall, where there was a large table covered with a green cloth. Around it were seated the principal and four other teachers, among them our own. I was one of the first called out. Dear teacher, how plainly I saw this morning that you are really fond of us. While they were questioning the others, he had no eyes for anyone but us. He was troubled when we were uncertain in our replies. He grew serene when we gave a fine answer. He heard everything and made us a thousand signs with his hand and head to say to us, good, no, pay attention, slower, courage. He would have suggested everything to us had he been able to talk. If the fathers of all these pupils had been in his place one after the other, they could not have done more. I could have cried, thank you, ten times over in the face of them all. And when the other master said to me, That is well, you may go, his eyes beamed with pleasure. I returned at once to the schoolroom to await for my father. Nearly all were still there. I sat down between Garon. I was not at all cheerful. I was thinking that it was the last time that we should be near each other for an hour. I had not yet told Garon that I should not go through the fourth grade with him, that I was to leave Turin with my father. He knew nothing, and he sat there, doubled up together with his big head resting on the desk, making ornaments round the photograph of his father, who was dressed like a machinist, and who is a tall, large man, with a bull neck and a serious, honest look, like himself. And as they sat thus, bent together, with his blouse a little open in front, I saw on his bare and robust breast the gold cross which Nellie's mother had presented to him when she learned that he had protected her son. 
but I must tell him sometime that I was going away. So I said, Garan, my father is going away from Turin this autumn for good. He asked me if I were going also. I replied that I was. You will not go through the fourth grade with us, he said. I answered, no. He did not speak for a while, but went on with his drawing. Then, without raising his head, he inquired, And shall you remember your comrades of the third grade? Yes, I told him, all of them, but you more than all the rest. Who can forget you? He looked at me fixedly and seriously, with a gaze that said a thousand things, but he uttered no word. He only offered me his left hand, pretending to continue his drawing with the other, and I pressed it between mine, that strong and loyal hand. At that moment the teacher entered hastily, with a red face, and said in a low, quick voice, with a joyful intonation, Good, all is going well now. Let the rest come forward. Brave, boys. Courage. I am extremely well satisfied. And in order to show us his contentment, and to cheer us, as he went out in haste, he made a motion of stumbling, and of catching at the wall to prevent a fall. He, whom we had never seen laugh, the thing appeared so strange that instead of laughing we were dumbfounded. All smiled, but no one laughed. Well, I do not know. That act of childish joy caused both pain and tenderness. All his reward was that moment of cheerfulness. It was a compensation for nine months of kindness, patience, and even sorrow. For that he had toiled so long, for that he had so often gone to give lessons to a sick boy. Poor teacher! That and nothing more was what he demanded of us, in exchange for so much affection and so much care. And now it seems to me that I shall always see him in that act. When I recall him through many years, when I have become a man, if he be alive and we meet, I shall tell him about that deed which touched my heart and I shall give him a kiss on his white head. Farewell. Monday, 10th. At one o'clock we all assembled once more for the last time at the school, to hear the results of the examinations, and to take our little promotion books. The street was thronged with parents who had even invaded the big hall, and many had made their way into the classrooms, pushing up as far as the master's desk. In our room they filled the entire space between the wall and the front benches. There were Goroni's father, Dorosi's mother, the blacksmith Procasi, Coretti, Signor Anelli, the vegetable vendor, the father of the little mason, Stardi's father, and many others whom I have never seen, and on all sides could be heard a whispering and a hum that seemed to come from the square outside. The teacher entered and a deep silence ensued. He had a list in his hand and began to read at once. Abatucci promoted sixty seven tees. Arcini promoted sixty five seven tees. The little mason promoted. Carassi promoted. Then he read loudly. Ernesto de Rossi promoted seventy seven tees and the first prize. All the parents who were there and they all knew him said. Bravo, bravo, Dorasi, and he shook his golden curls with his easy and beautiful smile, and looked at his mother, who waved to him with her hand. Godoff, Goroni, and the Calabrian promoted, then three or four sent back, and one of them began to cry because his father, who was at the entrance, made a menacing gesture at him. But the master said to the father, No, sir, excuse me. It is not always the boy's fault. It is often his misfortune, and that is the case here. Then he read, Nellie promoted sixty-two seventeenths. His mother sent him a kiss from her fan. Stardy promoted sixty-seven seventeenths. But at hearing this fine fate, he did not smile or remove his fist from his temples. The last was Votini, who had come very finely dressed and brushed promoted. After reading the last name, the master rose and said, Boys, this is the last time that we shall find ourselves assembled together in this room. We have been together a year, and now we part good friends. Do we not? 
I am sorry to part from you, my dear boys. He interrupted himself, then he resumed. If I have sometimes failed in patience, if sometimes without intending it, I have been unjust or too severe, forgive me. No, no, cried the parents and many of the scholars. You have ever been kind. Forgive me, repeated the master, and think well of me. Next year you will not be with me, but I shall see you again, and you will always abide in my heart. Farewell till we meet again, boys. So saying, he stepped forward among us, and we all offered him our hands. As we stood up on the seats and grasped him by the arms and by the skirts of his coat, many kissed him. Fifty voices cried, Farewell till we meet again, teacher. We thank you, teacher. May your health be good. Remember us. When I went away, I thought oppressed by the commotion. We all ran out confusedly. Boys were coming from all the other classrooms also. There was a great mixing and torment of boys and parents bidding the masters and mistresses goodbye and exchanging greetings among them. The mistress with the red feather had four or five children close to her and twenty around her, depriving her of breath, and they had half torn off the little nun's bonnet and had thrust a dozen bunches of flowers in the buttonholes of her black dress and in her pockets. Many were making much of Robati, who had that day, for the first time, abandoned his crutches. On all sides one could hear, Goodbye until next year, until the 20th of October. We greeted each other, too. Ah, now all disagreements were forgotten. Voltini, who had always been so jealous of Dorasi, was the first to throw himself on him with open arms. I embraced the little mason and kissed him just at the moment when he was making me his last hare's face, dear boy. I embraced Prakasi. I embraced Garofi, who announced to me the approach of his last lottery, and gave me a little weight of manjolica with a broken corner. I said farewell to all the others. It was fine to see poor Nelly clinging to Garoni, so that he could not be taken from him. All crowded around Garoni, and it was farewell, Garoni. Goodbye until we meet again, and they touched him and pressed his hands, and made much of him, that brave, noble boy. His father was perfectly amazed as he looked on and smiled. Garoni was the last one whom I embraced in the street, and I stifled a sob against his breast. He kissed my brow. Then I ran to my father and mother. My father asked me, Have you spoken to all your comrades? I replied that I had. If there is any one of them whom you have wronged to go and ask his pardon and beg him to forget it, is there no one? No one, I answered. Farewell, then, said my father, with a voice full of emotion, bestowing a last glance on the schoolhouse. Farewell, my mother repeated. I could not say anything. End of section 24. Recording by Kristen Lewis. Houston, Texas. End of Heart, a Schoolboy's Journal, by Armando Diamichis, translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood.